So Lori, you're here with us today. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to do a post-op video just to check in with you because I've gotten emails and inquiries uh, from patients uh, more or less all up and down the West Coast like, okay, where is she now? How is she feeling? What is she doing? What's the long-term uh, stability of the therapy is what most people want to know. So uh, I'm just going to kind of go over real quick your list of symptoms prior to uh, DTR therapy, and then we'll find out kind of where you're at now. Okay. So you had, when you came in, and this was uh, two years ago, or about two years ago, in, in 2015 when we started our therapy, you had ringing in the ears, uh, earache, ear pain, pain in the cheek muscles, and that was primarily on the left side, if mm -hmm. I remember, yep. Uh, swallowing difficulties, voice irregularities or changes. Uh, they said the vibrations were very painful. Very painful. Uh, a feeling of a foreign object in the throat, and then you wrote in electrical shocks. Yes. Okay. Teeth, you put uh, sore soreness of the back teeth, clenching and or grinding at night. Uh, and then when we got to the mouth, uh, we had discomfort, limited opening, can't find the bite, inability to open and smoothly, and multiple bites. So it's interesting, You, what were you diagnosed with originally? Trigeminal nerve. Okay, trigeminal neuralgia. Yeah. Yeah, trigeminal nerve pain. Okay, and so how did you find me? I can't remember. What... I found you on the internet. Well, they were giving me gabapentin, and they just wanted me to live on that. So they had, we did the MRI and checked for a brain tumor and we looked through all that and everything was fine and he said, well, you have trigeminal nerve problems, so we're just going to put you on gabapentin and you may live on these until you die and you can take up to 3,600 milligrams a day. And I said, okay, well, that's not going to work for me, but for now, give me the candy and I'll do my own research. Sure. And then I found you on the internet. And, you know, I, it was just me digging and digging, and it made sense to me that something was wrong in the mouth. I started researching TMJ, and I started getting deeper and deeper into my own situation. And then you came into the, into the picture. And I said, you know, then I seen, I went on YouTube and seen the DTR thing, and I thought, you know, this makes sense to me. And that's when I called you and you gave me a personal phone call back within like 10 minutes and spent 30 minutes on the phone with me and I said, this has never happened in my lifetime. <laughs> well, it, ne it doesn't always happen in this office, I can assure you. <laughs> well, I would say it does, so I will debate that with you. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, so you ended up coming in and we did a consult. And... On your day off, you scheduled me on a Friday that you weren't even supposed to be working. Oh, I forgot And about you that. brought me in immediately yeah. because you were concerned yeah. so let's just put that in there okay. <laughs> <laughs> just saying so how long had you been suffering prior to getting the diagnosis because if I remember right you had some symptoms and then like it was steadily kind of getting worse started in February of 2015 that's okay. when it began and I started working through you know, I went to, got the medicine, did that, went to Shirk, which he's a chiropractor that people spoke very highly of. I said, I'm going to put him in the mix because I know he's very smart. Right. So I started doing a series of adjustments. I'd never been to a chiropractor before. And he said that my neck was, you know, that it was off. I mean, there, it was definitely a problem. But then also in conversation, he had led me and told me that, you know, I didn't realize the teeth are the beginning of the spine. It's all connected, which I didn't, I didn't have the intelligence to know that. And I was like, well, that was interesting. So then I started getting, you know, I just started getting curious. And that's when I got into the TMJ and all of that. And I even asked my original dentist, you know, no, no, no. And my original dentist had never even told me that I was a clincher or a grinder. Sure. By looking at my teeth all my life. You know, and I'm 57, I'm not 12. So I was confused by that. So that's when I reached out to you. And you brought me in the office and you did the DTR, you did the first bite test, and you're like, you know, your left side, I was taking 
most of it on my left side. I was biting all the time on the left. Yeah, it was like 60-40. Yeah, and I was clinching then at night, so with the stress and the pain and everything else, you know, then I was just wearing out this side. You know, how are things now? What do you notice now as far as, you know, your symptoms post-treatment? I I have no symptoms. I mean, I'm I'm 100%, you know, I don't even, and I... It's now not even in my subconscious. You know, it used to be that if I went somewhere, it's like, oh, I better take the gabapentin just in case. Or you have this mental thing that you're like, oh, I, sh- I, ke- I used to keep him in the car. Sure. I kept him in the car. I kept him in my purse. I kept him, you know, with me, waiting, you know, for that next thing. And when it was done, it was done. When the bite was right, it was over. I have never experienced anything. I've never had any jaw pain. I've never had any muscle pain in my face. I never had nothing. The, the electric shock? Oh, the... Nothing. Yeah. Oh, gosh, no. So, I guess the next logical question would be, um, had the doctors who had treated the dentist, uh, the doctor who gave you the diagnosis, have you gone back and shared like okay this is where i'm at now or Mm -hmm. so what was the feedback on i actually talked to the doctor they'd given me the mri for the brain tumor and everything else and he told me that he didn't acknowledge a chiropractor and he didn't acknowledge the dentistry and that he said that i was just one of the ones that went into remission okay so he's fully expecting you to at some point Mm -hmm. maybe have pain again Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's Unfortunately, that's the disconnect. He had absolutely, he wasn't flexible on that at all. And we had a little bit of a a confrontation over it. And I said, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So I said, if you would take the time and look it up yourself, maybe, you know, because he was in a position he could help other people. So that's why I felt it was important. Yeah, absolutely. Because you made a comment about something about uh, the... uh, MVD or the gamma knife was not really that appealing to you as far as a treatment modality. Well, it will do the research on that. I mean, that fails most of the time, or it's a short term reality, or I mean, to me, I was just that would just be pointless. Yeah. I mean, who would put themselves through that and choose not to do this? That just makes no sense to me. <laughs> right. I mean, it's non invasive. Because I've talked to a lot of people who have trigeminal neuralgia, and I'll ask them, is it on one side or both sides? And they're like, no, it's on. It's just on the one side. Um, and then you'll ask them things like, well, do you have neck pain? Do you have shoulder tension? Do you have ringing in the ears? Oh, yeah, I have all of that. But if you look at the diagnostic criteria for trigeminal neuralgia, um, it doesn't really say that ringing of the ears or tension in the shoulder and neck are contributory as far as making the diagnosis because the diagnosis is made primarily by just a presentation of the symptoms. Right. And we rule out um, a tumor or a neuroma with an MRI and try to see if there is compression of the trigeminal nerve being wrapped around uh, a blood vessel because that's what that's how I was taught and that's generally how Uh, the diagnosis is being made. So anyway, there was a couple of papers that came out uh, over like a, I don't know, 10 or 15 year period where they started looking at controls versus people who complained of trigeminal neuralgia. And what they found was that there was a vascular compression of a portion or part of the trigeminal nerve, and not only in the people who reported the pain, but in the people who reported no pain. Okay, so the control said, well, I don't have any of these symptoms. So then it becomes okay. Well, what we're missing something, because if the if the uh, if the if the diagnostic criteria is there's a there's a blood vessel that's sitting on the nerve that's keeping the nerve continuously excitatory. All right, how do you explain in the patients that don't have any pain, but they have this condition? What do you what's what's different? What do you attribute to it? So. And trying to educate other patients and saying, look, I really think, you know, I'll send up my signs and symptoms and I'll put it on, you know, Facebook or the internet uh, and just say, do you have any of these other symptoms? Well, oh, yeah, I have many of those symptoms. Okay, well, I would argue then it's probably not trigeminal neuralgia. Or 
in the very least, maybe you have trigeminal neuralgia and TMD. And if we can get half of these symptoms knocked out, would that make your life better? All right, well, listen, I, I appreciate you coming in and still glad you did the therapy. Oh, you know, I would, you know, if I could pound on a million drums and get people to follow me, I would have them follow me. It's like, I, I really, even I've gone to the Facebook page and the trigeminal nerve and stuff like that. It is so interesting to me how they still lean heavier on the medical side and they have a hard time coming over to the dentistry side. I am actually shocked by that. From the first visit, it was better. And then we kind of, you know, and then it was still real prominent. But each visit was like better, 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 gone. Ooh.